Good morning. Welcome to the second Sunday of Advent, the time of expectant waiting and preparation for the celebration of the Nativity of Jesus at Christmas. We're blessed this morning to have Reverend Taylor Hill with us again today. He's joined us to lead the Lord's Supper later in our worship, so thank you again, Pastor, for joining us today. We're in need of volunteers to unlock the church on Sundays for each month of the year in 2016. There's a sign-up sheet along with the details in the narthex. Bob Hull can respond with any questions that you might uh, have about this, so please get with him after the service if you can. We want to welcome our northern friends back and welcome our visitors today. If you see someone with a red heart on their lapel, it means we have opened our hearts and doors to them. We hope you'll take time after the service to meet and greet them. And we hope each one of you will join us again next week for worship. The announcements are in the bulletin. However, we do want to call your attention to a few of those. There's an insert in your bulletin for the ordering of poinsettias, which will be placed here in the front of the church for our Christmas Eve service. If you wish to place an order, please complete the order form by December the 20th and place it in the offering plate, or you can bring it to the church office. Also, just a quick reminder of the potluck dinner this Wednesday evening and the Presbyterian Women All Circle Christmas Luncheon on Tuesday, which is open to men and women. Details for both of those are in the bulletin. Advent is a season of growing light. As we prepare to celebrate the birth of Christ, the light of the world, and look with hope for the dawning of God's new creation when Christ comes again in glory. Lighting our second Advent candle today are Sandy Pellerin and her grandson, Zachary Lightcap. God of promise, God of hope, we watch and wait for you to come into the darkness. We light the candle of hope. God of promise, God of peace, we watch and wait for you to come into the darkness. In a world where peace seems so, to be so far away, we call upon you, our Prince of Peace, to break through all fear, violence, and war. We await your shalom, where all will be reconciled through your peace that surpasses all understanding. On this second Sunday, of Advent, we light the candle of peace. Let us pray. Prince of Peace, we pray for peace that only you can bring through your Son, Jesus the Christ. Shine your light of peace through us that we might lead others in pathways of your shalom. Amen. Amen. Please join me in the call to worship. A voice cries out, prepare the way of the Lord. Make the road straight and smooth, a highway fit for our God. Fill in the valleys, level off the hills, smooth out the ruts and clear out the rocks. For our God is coming, let us worship God. Please join me in our prayer of adoration. We praise and adore you, O God, our Emmanuel, eagerly awaiting with expectant hearts for you to enter into our world. We long for your peace and trust in your promise. We hear your call to turn toward you, to change our lives and welcome you in. Meet us here and fill our minds with your wisdom and our hearts with your peace, that our worship together may open us up to the challenge of your vision of wholeness for all. In the name of the one who is coming, we pray, amen. Trusting in our gracious God who refines us to be all of who God intended us to be, let us confess our sin. Let us pray together our prayer of confession. God of grace, you blow the breath of life into our lungs. You have formed us in your image. 
And yet we acknowledge that sometimes we are not who you would have us to be. You challenge us to embrace the refining fire of your love, to meet you on the threshing floor of life, to be washed as with fuller soap. But in our heart of hearts, we would rather keep those things that would be removed in such an encounter. Through your grace, life-giving God, accept us as we are, unrefined, unwashed, the chaff mixed in with the grain, while helping us to move into a new way of being. Let us have a moment of silent prayer of confession. Friends, listen, for this is the good news. God's grace is wider than our wildest imaginings. God's grace embraces us as we are and where we are and draws us out to be the people we are created to be. Thanks be to God. Our reading from the Old Testament today is from Malachi, the third chapter, verses 1 through 4. See, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Indeed, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the descendants of Levi and refine them like gold and silver until they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in the former years. This is the word of the Lord. Sometimes there aren't words. That was beautiful. Thank you. It really touched me, so a deep thank you. <laughs> Let us pray. In these moments, oh God, we pause to remember that tiny child that is coming into the world, to sing songs of your joy and love, and to pray for your peace and hope to pray that you will teach us how to love. With your coming, you brought light into a dark world, joy into a painful world, hope into a fearful world, love into a lonely world, and peace into a warring world. We pray for peace within all walls, walls within our own homes, walls that surround each city, and town. Help us this day to remember your gifts of hope, peace, joy, and love. And as we journey toward the manger, we thank you also for what you have planned that we cannot know. We thank you for the unexpected, for all you have planned that is beyond our comprehension. We give you thanks. Give us courage in these days to prepare a manger where you might be born in us rather than keeping you enshrined in a religion or belief safely distant from where we live and move and have our being. This Advent, O oh God, while we reverently tell the ancient story of yours, of you coming, show us a way to prepare our hearts so that once again your peace may be born in us and in our world. Give us a spirit of holy expectation, a capacity to live our lives with wide eyes, filled with wonder for the surprises you do have in store for us. We pray this in the name of the one who teaches us to love, who continues to come to us in surprising, unexpected ways, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts 
as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Holy One, through your Holy Spirit, instruct us by the light of your prophets. Illumine our hearts that we may hear your call to become your path into the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from the third chapter of Luke, verses 1 through 6. Listen now to the word of God. In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was the governor of Judea, and Herod was the ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip, ruler of the region of Iteria, and Trachonitis, Trachonitis, and Licinarius, Cinerius, ruler of Abilene, hopefully I got those right, during the high priesthood of Annas and Sophias, Sophias, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall, shall see the salvation of God. This is the word of the Lord. During Advent, I can't help but think of the word journey as we all make that journey to Bethlehem together, to the manger, to Christmas, where we celebrate the birth of Christ in the world, where peace is anything but a reality in our world. And yet we journey walking that road and not always knowing what we need to do to prepare for Christ to come again. I don't really know much about roads, rather, I take them for granted, and I hop in my car and I go places, trusting they will be smooth and free of obstacles. However, when I went on a mission trip to Nicaragua two years ago, I discovered that smooth roads are not necessarily the norm every place around the world. Our mission trip took us to the mountain region of Nicaragua, somewhere near the Honduras border, and what seemed like we were in the middle of nowhere, now, I've only been out of the country one other time, so I was pretty wide-eyed on this adventure, coming face-to-face -face with things I just take for granted. Of course, the language barrier was the first obstacle. We stayed with a family on a farm, sleeping on the floors in our sleeping bag. But over the week of cooking tortillas together over a fire, farming the land, and even navigating between the cows and the turkeys that chased us, and other livestock while walking to the outhouse, we somehow overcame the language, of, the language barrier. Though we had tried to prepare for the trip taking Spanish lessons, probably the best preparation work had more to do with opening our hearts and minds to a new culture, as most of the words, once we got down there, just totally escaped me. But we were open. The year of trying to learn Spanish was a year spent imagining what it would be like to be with people in another part of the world. And that paved the road to connecting. It paved the road to connecting. But where we were, way up in the mountains, there were no paved roads. In fact, the roads we traveled on were pretty darn scary. While traveling in our truck, we shared the journey with horses and carts and motorcycles that zipped in and out of traffic and buses carrying people not only inside it, 
but on top of the roof and just hanging on. Anywhere that they seem, and they seem pretty comfortable with it. So as we swerved and curved to get to various sites to work, I can almost bet that some of the potholes that we saw could have swallowed up our whole truck. And if not swallowed up in the holes, then we could have been bounced out of the truck by these huge bumps or mounds of dirt that had yet to be smoothed out in the road. I can't even imagine what could have prepared me for those roads. So for a week, we bounced and we swerved and we sank in the roads, winding around, until at last we hit a brick road, a brick paved road. Our translator told us that over the last few years, they have been smoothing out the road leading to the high country, filling the holes, removing the bumps, leveling the ground until it was even. Even so, people could arrive safely. They made it even so all could arrive safely. In fact, over the last few years, about 50 miles of roads paved with bricks or pavers were put in place one by one, which we are told changed life radically and would continue to do so as the brickwork proceeded higher and higher into the mountains, one paver at a time. The obstacles were removed, preparing the way for life to be changed radically, clearing the way for people to count, encounter one another in safe, life-altering ways. Now, driving up and down I-75 about twice a day, I'm getting to witness the road widening, a bit different than Nicaragua, as here there's quite a bit more technology and the terrain is certainly more flat. But there's certainly work to be done. And in my untrained eye, work to be done to level the ground and make sure there's ample ways for the water to run off. It takes work to prepare a passageway, one that clears out the obstacles for us to travel so that we can greet people on the other side. The roads John the Baptist had in mind as he cried out to, for all who are list, to listen were probably less like I-75 and more like the ones in Nicaragua. In my imagination, preparing a way through the wilderness meant back-breaking work that inched along, evening out the road, clearing and preparing the way that Isaiah had promised years before, work that wasn't instantaneous. Rather, preparing a way through the wilderness was hard work, removing those obstacles, paving the way for the Prince of Peace, for God to enter into the world, free from barriers previously placed in the way, into the world that was filled with anything but peace. And John was heading the road crew, so to speak, though preparing the way involved bulldo bulldozers of repentance. He was emphatic about getting people to turn around, to change their course, to see new ways of doing things and acting on it. John enters the scene and ushers in a season of Advent, essentially screaming at the crowd, telling them, get ready. Get rid of all your behaviors, all your attitudes, all the obstacles that get in the way to receive the one who is coming because that one will radically change your life and this world. You see, John knew, John knew God was ready to enter. No one else needed to entice God or beg God or coax God or even make those shallow promises sometimes we might do where one day I'll do better if you'll just come save me. No, God was ready, and John knew it. But what was needed was to get ready. Not that God couldn't overcome obstacles. Clearly God could and had, and clearly God was about to. But what John knew was that people needed to overcome their barriers that would get in the way to fully receive him. They needed to get right with God and to be about what Anna Shirley calls soul maintenance, which at its heart 
is peace or shalom. She says, our souls hunger for shalom, for wholeness, for well-being, for healthy relationships, for all that makes up peace. It is woven into our core being and it is in our rhythm of life. And so we have to do what we have to do when it isn't in sync, when peace seems so absent so we can receive the Holy One. So John cries out in the wilderness to make the road straight, to make the ground even, all work of returning the road to a pathway of righteousness, a pathway of rightness, a path of peace, all preparation work so the Prince of Peace could enter and be known. On this second Sunday of Advent, I think about my journey, I think about our journey, and I wonder what mountains need to be lowered, what valleys need to be filled, what pathways need to be altered, so we might more fully open the doorway for the Prince of Peace to enter into our lives. I hear John crying, crying out to turn around to repent, to change, because God is coming. And I hear Malachi telling me, telling us to be refined, to be about being purified because God is coming. And I wonder what that means. Sometimes it seems nearly impossible. Peace seems so far away. And any step I might take in my life, or even more outwardly, seems like just a drop in the bucket. Sometimes the road is pretty twisted up where violence and death and hunger and our anger are all too commonplace. This week, another mass shooting and lives were lost, which has come, become just all too commonplace. Racism seems to be just as present as it ever has been, and the implications thereof just devastating. People live in fear all over the world. Poverty is not just in a developing country, but right here in our backyard, literally. And even closer to home, we get into squabbles, and rather than filling the valleys and making the mountains low, we dig deeper holes and throw the dirt on the hills to make the peaks even higher. Sometimes life just isn't peaceful or peace-filled, and we know that all too well. And so we live in that reality as we encounter John the Baptist, who not only cried out in the wilderness for the people of his time, but cries out for you and for me to repent, to turn around from our ways that build division. And he cries out to us to be about a life that brings wholeness and reconciliation to live as people of shalom because God is here and God is coming again. During Advent, we are invited, well, more than invited. John the Baptist isn't send, sending out this polite invitation to us. He is pretty darn emphatic that we are to prepare our hearts, prepare our minds, prepare this community of faith by living as people of peace. And we are empowered to do so, brick by brick, painstaking brick. We are empowered to do so, action by action by exhausting action. And we are empowered to do so, word by intentional word. And together, we will come together. We untangle the road and rebuild it paved with peace. For the Prince of Peace, who comes again, who will transform all of life. I wonder what that looks like. I wonder what labels we need to name each of those bricks so we can start that work of making a pathway of peace. Advent is a time where we can take time to name them and then get about the work and the act of preparation. Above the entrance to a dining hall, 
at a camp where I worked is a sign that hangs and it reads, all are welcome. It doesn't simply say welcome, as so many businesses, camps, and churches display. Rather, it's an intentional, inclusive greeting that it announces that no matter what walk of life, no matter what history one arrives at camp with, no matter what culture, race, or sexuality, all children are welcome to camp and invited to come into the dining hall and to the table. The last week of camp was usually one of my favorites. Children began arriving in the late afternoon, and like most weeks, parents helped their sons and daughters select their bunk bed and make their bed and get settled. And before long, campers were led by their counselors to their first activity, which was dinner. What was unusual about this week was that it was an intentional week set aside to reach out to kids in a rather diverse group. Some arrived in wheelchairs. Some arrived with dogs to help guide them. Some arrived with other special needs, whether physical or emotional. Children and youth came as they were, sharing what they were, and so did we, the staff. And I'll never forget this other John. This one was not John the Baptist, but he was John, and he was 15 years old. John never knew a stranger, and he enacted the all are welcome sign throughout the week, and especially at meals. It was the first night and the first gathering of the session, and like most first nights, campers arrived excited and a bit nervous about the unknown. John's cabin was the first to the dining hall and had the extra responsibility of setting the tables. Counselors and staff explained the task ahead of them, and campers began setting out the forks, setting out the knives and the spoons at each rectangle ta table. Soon the other cabins arrived, and campers took their place at respective tables, John assuming the responsibility of greeting each camper who came through the door. After all had arrived for dinner, the staff noticed that somehow we had not set up enough chairs, and we were about 10 short and, ten, and another table short. So John, with all of who John was, he was pretty intuitive and noticed that we were scrambling to set up this whole new table so we could fit everybody in. And in the midst of a bit of chaos on the first night, and while our backs were turned, John had somehow talked to all the kids and managed to get all the tables together as one long rectangular table. One long straight table. And then we added the 10 chairs. When I asked John what he was up to, he casually said, we all belong here together at the table. After singing the blessing, we shared our first dinner at one huge table where there was room for all and all were welcome. A table where all belong, where there are no obstacles. I don't think John knew how radical his statement and actions were. And as I look now at one table filled with perhaps the most diverse group I'd ever shared dinner with, a group of children who the world might marginalize, I couldn't help but look around and wonder if this was an incredible glimpse of the kingdom of God. Children who were diverse, authentic, trusting, humble, giggling, and loving gathering together at one table that grew and grew and grew until large enough where all could sit together. And though not a road, when John pushed those tables together, it was an act 
of peace. It was an act of Advent preparation, removing the obstacles that got in the way of wholeness. It was an act that prepared and welcomed a whole community to be one and encounter Christ in the relationships gathered at table. I'm thankful for John that reminded me at camp that we all belong here at the table. And maybe we can be more like John, pushing the tables together, making a pathway straight, making room for peace and wholeness. We all belong and we encounter the Holy One, doing whatever it takes we can do, changing whatever it is we can change, making signs that welcome and embody hospitality, filling the holes that need filling, lowering the mountains that need lowering, so all can belong, so peace is ushered into the world and right into our lives. So welcome to the table. The candles are lit that remind us that the Prince of Peace has come and will come again. The candles are lit that remind us to be pavers of shalom as we get ready. And the candles are lit that welcome us to the table where we encounter the Prince of Peace mysteriously right here in our present who teaches us how to love. Amen. Let us stand together and say what we believe using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. During Advent, we're invited to be pavers of peace. We're invited to push the tables together to make the pathway straight so that peace may be known and so that we can prepare for Christ who has already come to come again. So during Advent, be about preparing through laying bricks of peace. And as you go out in the world, know that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit goes with you wherever you go. Amen. Amen.
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. One more. One more.